this Veterans History Project interview is to be taking place the 3rd of June, 2005. My name is Kate Wallachie of the Niles Public Library District. I'm interviewing Walter Bussey. Um, Mr. Bussey learned of the Veterans History Project at the Niles VFW Hall. So now that's all I say. <laughs> Not very exciting. The ad address or something like that? Uh, yeah. 7914. 7519. No, no, 7914 North Moa. Oh, there you are. So now we know where you are. Yeah. So, um, you were, sorry, missed this. So you were drafted into the Seabees in the Second World War. Right. Did you, um, did you get to choose anything or were you, you were drafted and... Well, I asked for the Navy and, uh, as it turns out, I, uh, I had about three deferments from Teletype Corporation where I worked and uh, for 46 years total after all. But they, uh, because I was in uh, the machine shop running uh, a milling department, uh, milling uh, machines and gear cutters and profile machines and all that, I had uh, been working for this government company that had made communications for the military. And that's what Teletype was all about in the early days. And, uh, but I, I was, uh, you know, uh, eligible for the draft and because of my job, I had three deferments. And then I got um, drafted and went down and asked for the Navy and uh, wound up in the uh, Navy Seabees. At the time, I wasn't aware what the CVs was exactly, but it was the Navy, which, um, as it turns out, I, I was, uh, I thought I would be, they asked, what is your occupation? I was a machinist, and I thought I'd be a machinist in, in the Navy. Well, I wound up in the, uh, in the CVs in the 18th Special Battalion. And that was a battalion that was um, geared for loading the ships. And uh, we went to uh, Williamsburg, Virginia, and the CB camp down there. Uh, and then we I went after um, two months of training down there, we went to Providence, Rhode Island. And there we got a hands-on um, instructions on how to uh, load a ship with running winches and uh, cables from one ship to another and and being able to uh, take care of at that time we were we were just using um, say um, uh, canned goods um, cigarettes and stuff like that for practice as it turns out when we got over well at that point we had like six weeks of advanced training in Providence, Rhode Island. We went back to Virginia, the Norfolk, uh, Virginia, got aboard the USS Knox. For it was like 12,000 guys were on the ship. And we went through the Panama Canal. We zigzagged all through the, the waters going down in that area because they had heard they were German submarines in the area being on the uh, Atlantic side. So we went through the Panama Canal and at, when you go through the Panama Canal you get a special pilot that is uh, trained by the Panama Canal organization. The staff, in other words. He's part of the staff. So he's supposed to know what how with our, our boat is, our ship is. It's not a boat, it's a ship going through this canal so what does he do? He, unbeknownst to him apparently, we had um, a couple of guys fixing a lifeboat on the Davids. And these are little um, arched supports that allow the boat to go over the side. Well, there was three or four guys in the boat and they were, and they were um, actually uh, fixing the boat only he got too close and he wrecked the, 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 the lifeboat. And these guys are jumping in the Panama Canal to save their life for a little 
for the pilot didn't realize how close he was to the structures along the canal. So these guys are in the in the drink, you know, and this guy is crunching, crunching. I'm looking at this thing, and this boat is getting all tangled up, you know. And make a long story short, we stayed overnight there because we couldn't go any further into the Pacific without having full life uh, preservers and and it's uh, and, and the lifeboats. So we stayed overnight in a, and we got off the the ship in in uh, for an hour just to get off this boat. You know. Of course, on the way, everybody was getting sick. You know, I'm, I think I must have had just oranges. You know, for a, for the seven days that I was there. So and I wound up uh, getting to Hawaii. We saw a few whales out there and stuff like that. I got to uh, Diamond Head. It was on my grandfather's birthday, April 23rd. Shakespeare's birthday. Too. Yeah, and as it turns out, it was memorable from that standpoint. But then I found out not too long after that that he had passed away. And, you know, but uh, so as it turns out, we stayed there and had more training, and waiting for some kind of a ship. We didn't know what we were because we were actually on the USS Knox as a transport. So we get over to Hawaii, and then we occupy what was previously nurses' quarters. They were in Quonset huts, and they gave it to us. What did and they do with the nurses? They moved them out somewhere, I don't know. But as it turns out, we had 600 guys in our outfit, and they gave us their quarters. Now, in Hawaii, the thing about a Navy guy is that he wears whites. And the thing that we were allowed to do, because we were there for like five weeks, I can't remember exactly, but we were allowed to go to Honolulu on Liberty. Well, that's great, you know, but the, how do you get there? So we wind up having um, to get, get a ride from the Jeep or some other guys going there, and we have, in Hawaii, they have all this soil is lava, red lava. So when we come back from there, we had to spend like two days of soaking our whites in the uh, Clorox barrel because we were all red from this dust and all this stuff in the car flying down, you know, getting in. So when we wind up getting into uh, Honolulu, I went to Waikiki Beach and went to, to um, swim in there and it was terrible because they, the coral is, rips your feet apart, you know, and stuff like that. But they did have some nice stuff. It was next to the Waikiki Beach at the time was um, was uh, the beachcombers. Well, that's where they had dancing at night with the girls, not the guys, <laughs> but they had girls. And I think you, I think you paid fifty cents or something like that for tickets or something like terrible that. Terrible price. Yeah, it was tough at that time. Fifty cents was, you can't even buy a Coke for that now. <laughs> so we stayed there for a while, went into Honolulu, and it had all these shops for uh, souvenirs and stuff like that. And then you could take a picture of yourself with a Hawaiian girl, you know, and stuff like that. So we. Did you take a picture? I think so, but I couldn't find it. I don't know what happened to that thing, you know? <laughs> Give me just a second. Let me let me pause this one first. Sorry to interrupt. So you have no picture of yourself with a girl, although no, you're sure No, I just have my, my picture of myself somewhere. Well, and, that's not bad. Of and me and my whites, you know, and uh, one white hat and white suit, you know. But um, so we wound up going uh, from there. Our, our ship was, um, we were told our ship was uh, out there in uh, any we talk is where they had some practices for the atomic bomb, you know. But we didn't go ashore. We were just out there and we were uh, on, a, on a merchant ship. And that was our transportation. Merchant ships were our uh, transportation getting to our Ritz-Carlton was the barge. And I have a picture out there, in fact, of this barge. Come to think of it. Everybody laughs at it. So do I. <laughs> 600 guys on this thing. <laughs> and fortunately, I was sleeping on the water deck, which is, a, you know, a level with the sea. Guys were <laughs> below us, then we had another group on top of us, and then we had the officers above that, 
we had a storm, we had a nice roly-poly uh, barge, you know, this hotel was uh, really uh, rolling at, at some times, we thought we were going to roll over, in fact. All our gear would fall on the next guy, you know, and when we were aboard, well, we got aboard this thing, and <clears throat> it was APL-14, that was the, the Navy name for this thing, they didn't give it names per se, but they had APLs. They had up to 17 or 19, and we had number APL 14. So, what does the APL stand for? Do I you think know? there was um, something about personnel um, living or something, you know. Is that? But um, so we wound up uh, going aboard this ship, uh, this uh, hotel, and then we went out to Ulithi. It's the largest harbor in the world, a natural harbor, that we wound up supplying Halsey's fleet with ammunition. We actually moved a hundred ton a night of ammunition. And we worked 12 on and 12 off. And within them 12 hours, you had to do your washing, sleep, have any liberty, write letters and stuff of that, of that nature. That was your 12, and what they would do, they'd come along in a Higgins boat. Now a Higgins boat was like the first wooden um, landing, a beach landing craft. The front door would flop down and they would be on shore. So we had a, uh, started out with them and then they came along and they had um, an LCM, it's a landing craft mechanism where tanks were put in there, and they had a steel body and a coxswain. And um, as it turns out, they would drive us to the New Jersey, uh, any ammunition ship, and we would load 16-inch shells and the powder, and the 8-inch shells and the powder, 5-inch shells for anti-aircraft guns. And that was our whole thing. We were preparing uh, for Halsey to attack Japan. So we were there from, um, oh, I'm not quite sure how many, how many days or weeks we were. Then all of a sudden, I woke one, one day and here one of the oil tankers that was in the harbor was set ablaze. And the Japanese had come in with six uh, many subs, one man subs, and they were supposed to have um, an air attack at the same time, but they got this tanker and blew it up. And I could see it out the portal, I could still see it as I sit here. This thing was blazing like heck. Because these oil tankers were the supply of all our Navy ships for fuel. And they went after that and they were supposed to have this attack, but somehow the air, air, the air, uh, uh, force that the Japanese Air Force either was intercepted or didn't get in there. But what happened, these Japanese subs are so small they would come in under our battleships, under our cruisers, and they would sneak in when they opened the nets for our guys. They'd be right there. And you see this in the movies, it's fact. Six of them came in, I think there was another, one of them was uh, found after this, we were on three days of what they call general quarters. And for those three days, our uh, destroyers were sending off depth charges all over. So the guys are on the bottom, the six, uh, I don't know, we had like 200 guys down there sleeping. All they could get is boom, 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 like boom, boom. These depth charges, they couldn't sleep, you know? <laughs> three days of this. So as it turns out, we finally found that the end result was that they got uh, one was uh, beached on the coral, and they got the other five. They, they sunk them, you know. But I don't know if they had got prisoners or nothing like that. Another incident at, the, uh, at this particular um, uh, Lithy, I was watching a movie one night. 
So I'm looking out the, uh, from the movie, you won't believe this, I was looking at the movie from the back side. <laughs> that place was loaded up front. <laughs> so I have, I'm in a little corridor watching this movie. I don't know what the heck it was. It's been so long ago, 60 years or so. But as it turns out, I see, I look out, and I see all these, these airplanes. And there are airplanes practice landing on one of our aircraft carriers, just just uh, maybe a mile away. So I'm watching these guys, you know, and they're coming in one by one. They land on this thing, you know, and there comes another guy, in, and there comes another guy, and they had about 12 guys coming down, landing on the aircraft at night now, because this is a, a sundown hit, is, is there, and I can see these guys just, when they come in, they were practicing, and then all of a sudden, I see one guy go on beyond, and here he hit, he was a Japanese plane, and he came in and hit the chow hall, and he thought, because it had a tower, that it was a, a battleship, and he went to chow hall and killed a dozen guys, you know, himself as well, you know. But he crashed into this building, which he thought was was a, a battleship, and um, he knocked off some of our guys, and they he killed himself, and the same thing. So. But as it turns out, we um, we would load uh, depth charges for um, they were they were this big in diameter. They would go aboard a plane, and they were for uh, Tokyo Harbor and stuff like that. We we have um, oh 50 caliber machine gun uh, bullets in in metal cases, and if they were too old, we had to dump them overboard in the ocean, just because they they wouldn't allow those shells that came from uh, uh, World War One, say, or stuck too long that they wouldn't fire or jam the guy's gun. So we had to dump all well, barges full of that. I mean, barges that they were, you know, like eight foot high of, of these metal casings for 50 caliber machine gun bullets. And uh, we had to do that um, as we're told to do because it wouldn't take a chance on any of this stuff. So we were in Ulithi for a while, and then we went out to uh, out to the Philippines, what they call Samar. If you look on the, on the map of Philippines, it'll be Samar, S-A-M-A-R. So we're there doing the same thing. It's all our job was is to, is to move this hundred ton of ammunition or whatever was needed for these guys up front. Did you move it by hand, or did you yeah. move it? Well, my job, whether you want to visualize this, but do you know what a winch operator is? Probably not. Well, here's two ships. We're out here at sea, bouncing around like any storm or anything that normal waves could go. So we have one cable from this ship that comes over here, and one cable from this ship comes over here. Now, he's got the control of this one, and say, I got the control of this one. And what, between us, we've got, say, a, a 16 inch um, shell or, or two 500 pound bombs. And we take it off of this ship and put it over on this ship. And that's what it went to. In the middle of the sea. It's at at sea. And this we did 12 hours on and 12 hours off. It must be very nerve wracking. Oh, I went through, I was a signalman, I was in the hole. And I became a, 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 a whole boss, and then I was a signalman, then I was a winch operator. So once they feel you have the confidence that they can trust you with, the, say, a whole uh, a skid of bombs or, or detonators or whatever from one ship to the other, and they put you in that job, and I loved that job. It was so, so, you had to coordinate yourself. You had to have coordination with this other guy, because you didn't know what he was going to do or what the water was going to do to the ship, but they're pretty stable because they're, they're big, you know, they could be, um, I don't know, say 50 ton or something like that, something really uh, heavy, and they're stable, but the water is still, we had storms. As an example, we'd be out there in the Pacific and we'd be bone dry. All of a sudden, here comes a hurricane, comes through us and knocks us all around, we're soaking wet, and in five minutes we're dry. You know, back to work, you know. 
the thing that is is very uh, dangerous we would uh, we would take Higgins boats that were damaged in the first part of the war and send them back to be repaired until they got all these steel ones and they were landing craft um, uh, LCMs and they were they were just fantastic that was our taxi cab imagine having a taxi cab of an LCM for a whole year on the ocean I hate the ocean. I don't go on cruises. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hate the ocean before you started? Did you know? A little bit, but I never hated it <laughs> any more than I came out because I just, uh, although I, I got over being seasick and all that jazz, and I could be on a whale boat that, was, that would pick us up sometimes, and we'd have water up to here, mind you. We'd have, you know, it's fit for, for 20 <laughs> guys. We'd have 36 stuff. guys in it, you know. Yeah because the storm's coming, they want to get you back to your ship. So they would load up this little whale boat, you know, and I lost, I, my wristwatch was all um, salted, you know, and I lost it because it got salt in it because I'm trying to hang on to this. <laughs> but the, the, the most, um, then, let's see, so I was in Samara, we were doing the same thing, and then we were, we, <clears throat> I don't know if this is, I should even print this, but, <clears throat> kind of off the record on this one, <clears throat> we're, we're, I, well, I should go back. I was, <clears throat> when I was in Providence, Rhode Island, I was a sparring partner for this Indian fella. And, um, what the heck was his name? Wolf was his name. Husky. Full-blooded Indian. So, I'm a sparring partner in, in uh, as a fool, <laughs> I'll put it mildly, in Rhode Island, and they have a smoker. Well, he's supposed to fight somebody else. So the other guy doesn't show up. Who do you think is in the ring with this guy? <laughs> Me. <laughs> so I didn't last too long, because it was for real. You know, and a sparring partner, you did <laughs> play around. So, but we were pretty good friends. And while we were in Hawaii, I should go back and, and, and pick this up. We used to play ping pong, you know, because we're waiting for our ship, you know, and have a lot of time. And this guy, went, this guy Wolf, went into Honolulu and got tattooed. He had a, a battleship tattooed to his chest. Oh, no. And he <laughs> and I said, I can still see this guy moping around, you know, outside in agony. Oh my chest, my chest, he's. A, and he had a broad chest. He could put a battleship on it. This kid was pretty broad. And he was an Indian, full-blooded Indian. Wolf. I can't remember his first name, George, or something like that. But anyway, this guy was in agony. And then he had, then they had another guy that went there, and he had Alice put on his Alice. And he had a big snake. Oh, like the name big Alice. Alice. He had Alice. So what happened? With a snake? With a, yeah, he had a dagger and a snake, and they had Alice across there, you know. So Poor a, Alice. Alice was his wife back home. So we're out in the ocean, and he gets a dear John. He tried for a whole year to get that bugger off of his <laughs> arm. He didn't want any part of that thing. You know, he couldn't stand looking at Alice. <laughs> he wasn't waiting. She wasn't waiting for him, and he wanted to get rid of her too. <laughs> so, but he, his name was Williams. I'll never forget that guy's name. Forget his first name, Williams. But so those. Then he had. I can't tell you where he had these other tattoos at Wolf. He had other tattoos as well. <laughs> but did he get them all in Hawaii? Yeah. Or did he have any before? No, he got them all in Hawaii. So that's Wolf. Okay. So now we're out of of Ulithi. We're going out to Samar. We're in Samar again. I'm back in the story. I mean. <laughs> so what happens is we're real close to the island of Samar. So I don't know if this should be printed or what, but <laughs> this guy jumps ship and marries the chief's daughter. <gasps> just like you see in the movies. Wow. He stayed thirty days on the island, and he'd come back when we were going down to Pelio, he got back, he climbed the chain, and they rode him out, he climbed the chain and got back in there, he got seven years in Limpoworth. 
Oh, it's open. Oh, I can't believe that even happened. Fact. What did you, you think can, at the you time? Can, you can actually take some of this out because I don't know if it's it's true, but I don't know if they're going to appreciate it as I what? as we're doing. We, we appreciate it, and I don't see why someone else would. <laughs> oh my goodness! So where did you go from there? I went to Pelio. How, how did they take him away? Did he have to serve the rest of his time? Well, after they, he, got, he they, stayed for as much as they could get, you know, in transportation. He went back and court martialed him, and then we found out after because we didn't know what happened to the guy. They just took him away. You know, once he came back, he had to go to court martial. We didn't know where it was where it was going to be held or nothing. When we coming home, they said, "Yeah, he he got seven years in Leavenworth." You know. Oh. Which is a pretty uh, price to pay, you know, for twenty nine. Yeah, but he would laugh at us every day. He said, you know, and I heard some stories that he would come and say after he got home, you know, and before they took him away. But um, he was watching us, you know, and laughing. And he had, we had the last laugh though, you know, because he got nailed. So then we went to Pelilu. Now Pelilu was an island that MacArthur and some other, um, what would you call it, strategists argued about. Some wanted it to be bypassed. Others said, uh, MacArthur in particular said, he wanted that island so when he hit the Philippines that he wouldn't be attacked from the back while he's going in there, because it was only a stone throw from, from the Philippines yeah. in Samar. So, as it turns out, we went ashore, and <clears throat> this is our first time we had on shore duty now. So other, other times, the whole year was on the ocean. So I was given a truck, and I was a rigger. I would make cables and that, you know, I'd be, have a rigger's loft. Mm -hmm. I had a truck. And I would um, get orders for these slings. If they wanted to, to have a certain sling, they'd be, say, 10 foot long, 12 foot long, or 20 foot long. And it's wire cable, all metal. Some were rope, but they didn't use rope much because they didn't have much faith in it. So they used metal slings, wire uh, strands, in other words. And I would tie the loops in them and, and, and actually weave the tail end of this thing back into the body of the thing and and they would have tests on it, you know, and then they could haul anything they wanted, whether it's a, uh, a tank or whether it was uh, a box of shells or whatever. But did you it, learn how to tie knots beforehand? Yeah, yeah, I was... Did you uh, learn that in the, did you learn that while you were in the service or were you a boy? I learned in the service because I had to go through, see, it went in as a, the lowest grade, it, it wasn't... Um, it wasn't even first class. I went below that, and it could be first class, and then uh, coxswain, and then uh, a boatswain, and a boatswain second class. So it's like a sergeant in the army. So I had to learn all this thing. I was reading books all the time to pass the tests. I had to take tests like every three months to try and get an increase in my pay. And you have to have a rate change to do that. So I had to go from um, a, a boot right up to uh, taking all these exams, and I passed them. So I was able to, to do that when I got there, and I, uh, I really appreciated the fact that I, I had a responsibility, and I didn't have to go, um, <clears throat> although uh, I have a story to tell you in regard to going out to sea again. So, but that was my job. <clears throat> When I, uh, when we were there for a while, I got a letter from home, and uh, it was from my my mother, <clears throat> and she uh, said, well, <clears throat> she says, I don't know if you were there, but uh, she says, Frank Buckley was killed on Pelilu, my cousin, my mother's sister's son, the, the Buckley family. Uh, my mother was born in Dublin, Ireland, and um, that's another story. But 
Uh, this one was pretty sad because they said that Frank Buckley, uh, from the story, he was, one of his buddies was shot by a sniper and he went out to get his buddy's body and he was killed bringing his, body, his buddy back. And uh, what they had, I don't know who built it, if the CBs built it before us or the Army, but they had a chapel. And this chapel was loaded with crosses. Because as I tour the island after being there for, say, five or six weeks, I had come across a pillbox that killed 600 of our Marines coming ashore. And the bones were still around the shore and it was the the the, uh, the machine gun bunker was like two foot thick and they were headed right out on the ocean and it so happened so many times that the um, the tide was out so our marines had to come across in knee deep water and really had it slowed down and they shot 600 out of this thing so um, that was pretty tragic and then I make a long story short, I did find my cousin's body I went across there, Frank Buckley, PFC, and uh, in there. And <clears throat> as it turns out, um, it was kind of shock to the whole family, but ironic that I'm there, three or four thousand miles away from home, and my cousin is buried right, right there. So what we did in, in our liberty there was I, I would go up into the mountains and see what the Japanese, out the, the back trails of these mountains were donkey trails that they would bring up their ammunition. And this one hill that I went up there, I can't think of the, of the um, they have a, a shrine up there, I can't remember what it was, but inside this um, a mountain, they had it all dug out where the ledge was around the whole thing, like the Chicago Stadium. I'm not kidding, it was that hollowed and they had all their trucks down here and they had machine guns, or not machine guns, cannons that they'd pull back and, and fool you where they were, because if you shot back, you, they weren't there, you know, but they went up and they took this hill by, by, by hand to hand combat. And uh, even while we were there, uh, for the six weeks that were there, a little bit longer, the Japanese were coming down in their diapers and surrendering while we were loading something or doing something on the island. But this one case, they had a big job, and they uh, before I got my uh, my uh, <coughs> my truck and my uh, rigging job, um, we went out to sea one night. And we went on the LCM, this iron uh, taxi. And we went out to load the ship. And coming back, there was a typhoon came up. And we, they, they warned us. And as it turns out, they said, you better get back to your island and have something safe because we, we don't know where we're going to go during the night to ride out the storm. So we got in the, in the LCM and we're coming in and we go up, there was a channel that might be as big as this this room, I mean the other wall. And an LCM, yeah, it might have been 30 feet but it was all rock. So this guy guns it going through and we have a cross uh, water um, uh, coming across the entrance of this thing and we go up the, the rocks. So we're, I'm in the bottom, and as it turns out, we um, we came back down. But three guys were sitting up on the uh, on the well. See, this boat is um, this boat is like this, and it has a thing like that, and then it has this. Uh, front thing like that and the propellers are back here he sits up in here but the, the guys were on the back sitting here and they were sitting on a box and they didn't see what was happening there was three guys here and they all went into the into the ocean 
as, as this thing went up like that. Yeah. You know, and then these guys just fell into the ocean. So this cross current was so strong that we didn't know where they went, and the box went with them. So we didn't know, you know, we're out at, see, this is like 9 o'clock at night, and we're trying to get back in. We can't get in because of the, the um, cross currents in front of this thing were so hard, and it's raining like heck out there. So as it turns out, we had to go back out in the ocean. And going out in the ocean, we didn't know where we were going because we didn't have any anything bigger than this boat. And we came across an LST, no LCT. Now that's a landing track, a landing craft, say tank or truck. Now on it was uh, was high octane gas. These 55 gallons of high octane gas were on this thing on its deck. So in the transfer from our boat to their boat, I fell in between these things in the, in the storm. Gosh. And a guy caught me by my belt, and he saved me from getting drowned, you know. Because I, I, when, and you're in a, in a storm, you don't know where. You have to time yourself. Well, I timed myself. I thought I was right, but then something kicks in, mm -hmm. and I fell between these boats, and I was almost crushing it. A guy grabbed me from behind my belt, and he threw me into the LCT. And I slept on these 55-gallon uh, drums all night long. And as it turns out, this ship was battered up so bad that we lost the steering apparatus for the ship. So we don't know where we're going. And they said, well, there's an island six miles away. we got to try and make that just to stall. But we have no, no steering gear. So what they did, they, they got some rope, some heavy rope, and they rigged up a hand um, a hand, uh, uh, what they would call a tiller, and had, say, the, they would would wrap this around the rudder, and then they had some pulleys up here and some wheels, and they would just, by hand, try and steer this thing all night long. And then we went out to the six mile and came back, and we I slept there all night, and it was all a hand job on this particular LCT to steer this thing from going into any reefs around there. We had to be out in the ocean, but we didn't want to lose sight of, of where our markers were, you know. So then they came out in the morning and uh, in a, another LCM and picked us up and it was calm. Everything was like sunny and like you wouldn't even know what happened. So we went back in there and we looked on the, on the shore and here there was three guys sleeping on the shore. And we said, what? We thought we lost these guys. <laughs> they were the same guys. <laughs> the same guys. And what they did, they hung on to the box, we heard, and they went over the reef and landed on the shore. And the, the uh, our cap, our uh, uh, chief officer gave them a fifth of booze and they, went, they were drunk. <laughs> they couldn't, they, they they had drank to each a bottle and went to sleep, and they, <laughs> they were still sleeping there. So that was a little exciting thing. But in a sense, we were under, you know, always some danger because if an ammunition ship, which we unloaded, blows up, it's from five to ten miles around it that gets wiped down because there's so much on there. Because we had torpedoes, we had depth charges, we had 500-pound bombs, you know, and he'd put two slings on them and hook these up, and they're, they'd, they'd go together. We'd put them in the other ship aboard a uh, uh, aircraft carriers. Uh, in fact, it, it, people don't realize the strength of the ocean and the fear of the ocean. I was, I, I. I don't know if you ever heard of the Franklin. I saw the Franklin, which was hit by kamikaze airplanes at 7 o'clock in the morning. <clears throat> this ship lost like 1,700 people, killed, 1,700 sailors. And I saw this thing, and it was listing like that. An aircraft carrier is a pretty big unit. And this thing was in some harbor, and I can't remember just where, but they were bringing it back to the States to salvage, which they did. And they had... <clears throat> They had a present. One of our gangs, we were in gangs. Like I was in uh, Company A in Gang Five or something like that. 
Well, one of our company C uh, gangs went into that thing and they said it was just dreadful. All the dead uh, sailors were all over it yet, you know, but they had to drag it away from, from where they were before it would sink, you know, but they, in the meantime, they were, <coughs> they were tr trying to keep this afloat by shifting the water and the ballast to keep it afloat. So one of our outfits, uh, one of our gangs did go on that, uh, from our 18th Special, did go on that unit. And, uh, <coughs> and then I saw an aircraft carrier, it was called the Bennington. And, you know, this was a regular carrier, and is it true? Go ahead, tell me. You I was going to fold this thing. Can you tell me any picture? No, this was an aircraft carrier, and it's flight deck. Just say, because it's long, I'll do it this way. Mm -hmm. But this is the way aircraft carrier flight deck is. Right. Well, these two front parts of the flight deck were turned over like this from the force of the ocean and the wind. Oh, my goodness. Came in like this. That's a flight deck. Wow. Just bent them. You know, they were, this is steel. This isn't something out of cardboard. This is steel. That ocean is just so, so hard uh, on, uh, you know, at times. It's, it's drastic. Uh, things can happen. But, um, so, where was I? I was uh, floating around and we did get back, you know, and then <clears throat> I was working this detail, as I say, on, as a rigger. So I'm having a beer with my buddy on the beach, sitting on a picnic table. And we both had a beer, and this was a buddy, he was a medic, because I had, I had um, something happen to me. When I was in Ulithi, <clears throat> I had two five-inch shells in my hand, that weigh 105 pounds in a wooden box. So I fall into a hole I couldn't see, because I had this in front of me. I thought it was clear, because I could see ahead. Right. I thought it was clear, but somehow this thing, so, as it turns out, I flip with this thing and go down and tore my back apart. And then I had to get in what they call an ammunition box, a wooden box that might be something like this. So I'm in this box by myself. Well, I didn't have enough counterweight on the other side, so I'm going down <laughs> on my LCM, you know, kind of crook. So I tried to stay in the middle, but I had nothing to hold on to. And so I finally made it down there, and then uh, I, was, uh, I had to climb aboard my own ship out of this big well. I think we were as deep as this thing here. I had to jump up there, and I was in such pain. Make a long story short, I was, I was out for five weeks on light duty. And I went to a, I went to a hospital ship, and they had <coughs> bend over. <laughs> so you bend over, and the medic comes in, and he had a needle or a tube like this. Oh. And he, what did he give me? Um, oh, Novocaine or something like that. He shot that into my back, you know. So I, I maneuvered a little bit better, and I come out, and I, who was out there with Eddie Peabody playing his banjo like crazy, you know, entertaining the troops, Eddie Peabody. So I went back to my ship the hard way, which was really tough, even with that shot, because it was supposed to numb you up a little bit and kill the pain. Mm -hmm. But I had six weeks, and I met this med a medic, John Taylor, and I was sitting, I'm going back now to the to Pelidu, mm -hmm. and we're sitting on this picnic bench. We are both having a beer, just talk and talk, and I says, hey, John, take a look at what's happening out there. He says, what? I says, take a look at the ocean. He says, I don't see nothing. He says, look at that thing. Look at where the water is at the beach and look what's happening to it. I says, holy Christ, says, what's going on? So I said, something's happened to that ocean. And sure as hell, I says, John, we better get out of here. So we run up about a block off the beach, way up on high ground. And sure enough, the picnic tables that we were on, the ocean came in and took all the picnic tables and put them out in the ocean. There was a, a wave, a, 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 the repercussions of, a, a, at the time they had a big storm in Okinawa and Japan, mm -hmm. 
and we felt the tail end of it down here in the, in the, in the Peleliu Islands. So we said, yeah, that little bit uh, too much for us. You know, yeah, we just sat back and let it all go by and drank our beer. But it was a little oh, bit. Oh, you took the beer with you when you ran oh, out of the beer. Absolutely. Couldn't leave the beer on the bench. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> concerned for your life, but not that concerned. <laughs> yeah. So that was, you know, I don't know what else. Well, we had, while we were in Ulithi, <clears throat> the Japs had hit a cruiser, and the cruiser came back into Ulithi, and um, and they opened up the uh, the area, the hat, the uh, compartments, I should say, that were. Uh, where the torpedo had hit, and out came about four bodies of the of the crew. On the, the cruiser was okay, but this one section was flooded. When they had to, to go in there and see what was going on, mm -hmm. somehow these bodies got out and were floating around, you know, in the, in the uh, Ulithi Harbor. But I don't know the name of the ship or none of that stuff. But um, it's too long ago. But there, you know, we had. We had one one mishap. We talked about the ocean and and its uh, uproars. We had a, a night um, duty, and um, one of our chiefs um, was on a barge, and he was on the roof of the barge directing his gang to unload whichever way they were going on or off, and this barge took it terrible beating from the weather and he fell overboard. And some of our guys dived for over 10 hours to find, try and find his body and they couldn't find him. And um, one guy, and, and I remember the name was Sullivan, that, that, that dove in constantly for 10 hours just trying to find him and just, and daylight came and they didn't know where he was at. But, um, so that was the only port the ship they usually hatch. they usually cover a hatch with hatch covers, yeah. and these are planks that might be say three foot wide by six or eight foot long, and they fit between beams, mm -hmm. so it's a, it makes a floor. Now that covers these hatches that are uh, filled with all your ammunition and all your supplies. Well, sometimes the guy doesn't put the hatch cover on, and they put a tarp over this thing, so you don't know if there's a proper support for you. So this guy was coming aboard ship to do his time, and he he ran across the uh, the top of the tarp and fell right through. He went ah. down two stories. Oh, how awful! It broke his <clears throat> broke his. Uh, arms and, and, uh, and one leg, you know, and he was, he wasn't killed, but he he had a hell of a, uh, injuries on that. So but, uh, there was, a, you said there was, a, when you were hurt, there was a hospital ship. Yeah, in your Lithy, yeah. yeah. But we didn't always have a hospital ship. That so was did just... Did you have some place on board where people went? Did you have like a sick Oh yeah, you had a sick bay. We mm -hmm. couldn't smoke either in, in board the ship. How come? We couldn't smoke in a hole, but we could smoke along the side of the ship. We have a coke and a used to smoke two packs of cigarettes with nothing else to do. Finally quit in '53, thank God. Yeah. <laughs> but as it turns out, <clears throat> there was a lot of danger on on smoking. They say this, the the lamp is lit or the lamp is out. You know, and no smoking. And that was normally when you were aboard ship. But they have the gang plane, gangways along the side of the outside of the ship, and you were in the open air, and that's where you could smoke. Couldn't smoke on deck, on an open deck, because <clears throat> as, a, as a few cases we've had, you know what ether is? Mm -hmm. Well, ether is a substance that they put on, on the uh, powder bags to ignite to force the uh, shell out the, the gun. Well, we would, <clears throat> unbeknownst to us sometimes, we'd say, what's that smell? You know, and the guys would be looking for the, the powder keg, and they were metal. 
these ca these uh, cases of uh, for eight-inch shells, say, were um, metal, and and they're all like tubes, and inside was the the powder and the ether, and that's the way they're packed, ready to go. So several times, oh, well, I can't remember how many times we'd smell this ether. We had to find that that broken can and get it out of there because it would put us to sleep. Yeah. And I said, he was a hermetic. You know? <laughs> so we had to watch a few things, you know. And one time we were down in, in the hole and we had these step charges and they were going to uh, Tokyo Bay. And we were, we relieved this group. And when they say, hey, uh, there's something ticking down here. We can't find it, but I hope you can, you know. <laughs> It's a total thanks a lot, you know. <laughs> so we were down there for hours trying to find, and these things are stacked up. You know, there must have been 400 of these things around that we had to search through. We couldn't find it, and all of a sudden the ticking stopped. But we were, we never know. You never know what, when you're dealing with ammunition. Because, uh, so what else? So where were you? We didn't get you all the way home. Pardon? Where, where were you in your story? We didn't get you all the way home yet. Oh, well, I was in Peleliu. Yeah. And, and I saw my cousin, like I say, and, and got all that uh, under uh, my belt. And, uh, and, the, and the war was over, and then you start looking at how many points you get. Right. So, as it turns out, I had enough points, and I get aboard a troop. Um, no, a, uh, a a submarine tender. Our, I don't know how many guys from our outfit went aboard this thing, a couple of hundred. <coughs> we left Pelido, <coughs> went up to, um, <coughs> went into San Diego. And boy, I kissed the earth when I got on the USS soil. I kissed that sucker and I said, this is, this is for me, no more. <laughs> No <laughs> more boats. <laughs> so you got to San Diego. Yeah, and um, then I had marching bands and, and uh, cheerleaders and all that stuff, you know. So I stayed overnight there. Uh, I stayed there for a week or so. And I uh, when I got from the Pacific to this San Diego, we were put in, in uh, it was in December. Now I'm in the Pacific for a year and a half. I'm bored uh, out there in the uh, ocean for a year, mm -hmm. and my blood's pretty thin, so I'm freezing when I get in there. I got a pea coat on. I got two blankets. I'm I'm sleeping next to the next to the uh, pot-bellied stove, and I'm freezing. So it was um, it was cold, but my blood was so thin I couldn't stand it. You know. Mm -hmm. So I'll make another part of a long story short, this uh, this tailor, the medic, had an aunt that he got six hundred dollars for, from her. We went out and bought a car, a, a fifty no thirty six Chevy. So the medics were in the car with me. There was, maybe there was five or six of us. So we're going across the lower part of Cal uh, Arizona, going to Gila Bend, Arizona, and I'm out there because the car is smelling gas. I'm out on a running board with the hood up looking to see where the gas is leaking. Here it's on the manifold and it could have blew up in my face, you know. So as it turns out, uh, <clears throat> we, go, we were going through uh, this gila bin and we went back and we had a mechanic fix it. So then we're out there on, on the open road again going to hell bent for election, you know. We blew three pistons out the engine, and they're laying on on a road, and we're stranded with the Gila monsters out there. <laughs> and make a long story short, I stayed there for a day. I got a bus because these guys had to go get a new engine for three hundred dollars from Phoenix, Arizona, oh to the Gila Bend. I says I'm leaving. I want to get home for Christmas. So as it turns out, um, I get a I get a bus in Gila Bend. I go up to Oklahoma. And then I get up to Alton, um, and I got my 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 uh, duffel bag with me and, and the suitcase, and I'm running for a train in Alton, and I get aboard the train, and they pay two dollars, it's two fifty for a passage to Chicago. 
I'm sitting there relieved, and all of a sudden I feel the chugging over oh, going. As it turns out, we fell asleep, and at 3 o'clock in the morning, we're still in the place because <gasps> we went to the to, to the yard oh, and, no. and, st and stayed there till about 3 or 4 in the morning, and it finally went out, and I got home the day before, like Christmas Eve noon at 12 o'clock before Christmas. Just made it because I had to take a bus. Oh, man, I tell you, it was terrible. Was it great being home? Oh, yeah. I gained, you know, I gained like 10 pounds in a week, you know. I used to weigh 139 pounds when I came out of the service. I went in at 169, but it was all muscle. I could lift 100 pounds like nothing. But, um, hey, I'm sorry to keep you so long. No, no, that's what it's for. You know what I wanted to know? Um, did you go back to teletype? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And did you back. ever use anything that you learned? No, because it was a different occupation. It was a board ship. I became a senior engineer at Teletype, and I wound up uh, designing computer keyboards, the touch, you know, and all this Teletype and that. So, uh, 46 years. 46 years. Yeah, I came out of high school, out of Tilden Tech High School. Did you ever, did you ever go back to school? No, I was thinking of taking, they got a tour uh, that I understand is available for uh, people now, you know, it's, uh, it was a technical school, Tilden Tech, it was a, uh, like Lane Tech, only on the south side. Yeah. I was in the upper, say, quarter of my uh, graduation class, and in, in Teletype asked for a south side person rather than a north side from Lane. Me and another guy went there, I was too young, and they uh, hired me in September 25th and because uh, my birthday is July 5th and I worked ever since from deburring as a at parts so <laughs> I'm sorry did to take you, up all your time you for did, nothing that's, you know. that's not for nothing usually it takes about an hour and a half it usually takes most people about an hour. These guys are all crabby in their old age. I can't yeah. believe them. Crabby. Did you um, did you celebrate holidays on board ship? Not too much. Mm -hmm. The only thing we celebrated was the end of the war. So what did you do for the end of the they war? Had, they had uh, uh, all kinds of flares going up. And oh, man, they had the sky like the 4th of July yeah. out there in the, in the Pacific. You know, it was really something. But it was... Um, it was an experience that, that I think, in my opinion, I don't know if this for a quote, but I think all high school kids should pay two years in the service. Yeah. It gives you character. It gives you the facts of life that you have to sustain yourself and take care of yourself. And you have to work with kids your age that your life depends on it because they depend on you. It gives you that self-respect, I think, too. And, and, Keeps you in the street on narrow, I think. But it is hell. I mean, you know, I used to ride on a hook going from one ship to another and go down these rope ladders, these cargo nets, you know, it was nothing for me to do that, you know. But I showed my grandkids, what's that? You know, you know, they, they just don't, the, the kids aren't shown enough of what war is all about. Did you change your attitude about war and the, or the military? Between no, when I you always were? felt that you, you should go. Yeah. Except that my job kept me from those three deferments, you know, and uh, and they felt that I was more important there than than uh, the service at the time. So we had, uh, like I say, six hundred guys. I could show you the picture of the of the thing. You could laugh at that one. <laughs> <laughs> what else can I? I don't know. Is there, is there anything else you want to tell me? No, I don't anything think else so. Well, I want to thank you. That's a good interview. Very I don't know. It's in, it isn't, I, I don't have the war stories that, like I wasn't in the Battle of the Bulge and stuff like that, you know, where, where guys were dead, you know. Well, I always say to people that everybody's experience was different and everybody's experience is important. You know, we, we don't just need stories from people who did one thing. Mm -hmm. We need to know 
need to know what it was like for everybody. Yeah, you have to get a cross section, I guess. You know? Yeah, you want to know you want to know what it's really like, not not just what it's like when yeah, you're in a battle. Or two and a half years away from your family is is a long time. You yeah, know, and did you did you write letters? Oh yeah, yeah. I, I write to my mother and my aunt, you know, and but they were censored, you know. I didn't put the stuff in. I never seen my letters cut up because I never even attempted to uh, make it. Uh, so they'd um, they'd get a clean letter at home for the most part. But my dad saw my picture uh, of of our uh, <coughs> our Ritz Carlton in the paper, and he sent it to me. Yeah. And I, I got it somewhere. It's yellow. It's like, it's like the paper's like this. Yeah, I would imagine. It's real dark. <laughs> All that acid in the paper. Well, my brother had a harder time than me because he was shell-shocked in the, in the islands. Mm -hmm. And he was uh, blown off of a telephone pole and six guys were killed below him through a mortar shell. And he was laid up for two years, going to Michael Reese Hospital. And, Washington and the one in Ohio, but he married, had seven kids, but his smoking got him early. He died when he was 52. Very young. Yeah, with seven kids and some of them were like eight years old. Yeah, they must have been little. Yeah. So it affects us all, you know, in some way. Did you, um, you belong to the VFW. Did oh, you yeah. join any other veterans organizations? No, not veterans, but I'm <clears throat> I'm the Niles Museum membership chairman. I am a baseball league treasurer for uh, three years and, and a commissioner years ago. I think I've been, without a doubt, saying I've been with the Niles Baseball League for 35 years wow. straight in some and capacity. You, and you said you keep in touch with the guys that you were Yeah, I started that in, in 81. And I've been the uh, chairman of uh, reunions, you know, and I'm, I'm so sort of the spokesman for sending out all the mail. A guy would be chairman, say in Florida, he sends me all the stuff, then I send it to 185 guys. Wow. And I search these guys through the internet. Mm -hmm. I must have found 145 guys through the internet of my outfit. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, it's. I went with a guy some years ago, and he was looking at telephone books. You know, like this, you know. We go to Skokie Library, and then uh, I says, Ed, Ed Lesniak is his name. I don't know if he still goes over there by you, but I says, there's an easier way to do this. We got to have a computer, you know, and get online. So I took him over to Skokie, and I saw these computers, and they, uh, we made contact because I started, I, I started the, the Manasser. That's the, yeah, I was a park commissioner here in Niles for 22 years. And in that group, I wound up um, starting a, a Manasser, which is for the blind. As it turns out, um, <clears throat> I started uh, through the, the Niles Library. I wrote a letter to a, a, a Jewish millionaire and got these uh, monitors and these uh, magnifying glasses that you put your check mm -hmm. on there and you can read, you know. Right, a VTech machine. Yeah, right. And I started that in Niles many years ago. I also started the Niles bus service many years ago, the first in 69 as a parking That's machine. That's a great thing, that bus service. Yeah. And, and with this m monitor and that, um, I went to Skokie and, and saw they were using that and brought that back, you know. You are. Okay. You got. You got. Yeah. You gonna call me um, when you're leaving Tuesday. You're telling me about the bus service, and you were telling me. Oh yeah. Yeah, the bus service. I started it in '69 because I became a park commissioner, mm -hmm. and I, I <clears throat> was having a drink at the Lone Tree Inn with the president. I says, Jerry Sullivan, I'd like to suggest we have a bus service because our parks are so spread out all over down Milwaukee Avenue. It's hard for people to get to, to, to do everything. So he said, yeah, let's try it. I couldn't get the third boat until 1971 when Bill Keener came on. And then our, our director <coughs> wound up uh, saying that he had enough money for the bus 
and for the driver.